December 6, 1871. Over a hundred men from the area in and around Tucson, Arizona come together in front of that city's small adobe courthouse. Many of those gathered were Thono Otham farmers and ranchers who lived around San Javier del Bac, including Otham leader Francisco Galarita. Others, including Jesus Maria Elias, were prominent Mexican farmers and cattlemen from Tucson and Tubac. The English speakers from the group, who called themselves simply Americans, included William Ory, Tucson's first mayor and a prominent local pioneer, and Sidney DeLong, a former U.S. soldier and Tucson's mayor-elect. The men posed together outside the courthouse for a photograph, alleged to be the first photographic image of Tucson and its residents ever captured. The gathering that inspired this group photograph was not a business transaction or a local civic celebration. The men standing together outside the courthouse were preparing to attend a federal murder trial in which they were the defendants. These men, leaders in their respective communities, collectively stood accused of having brutally killed over a hundred people in the span of a single morning. The act at the center of the trial had taken place seven months earlier, nearly 50 miles northeast from Tucson, at the spot where the Aravaipa Creek meets the San Pedro River. Today, the site sits off of State Road 77, just north of the mining town of Mammoth and below Winkleman, Arizona. Land that now houses an RV park, Central Arizona Community College's Aravaipa campus, and a few places of residence was once home to a variety of inhabitants. It was known by different names. The Apache people who customarily foraged, hunted, and resided in nearby Aravaipa Canyon called sections of it by names that translated to English as Blue Water Pool and Big Sycamore Stands There. By the 1860s, the American soldiers who occupied a remote military encampment in the area called it Camp Grant. Camp Grant was little more than a collection of poorly constructed buildings, so ramshackle that one soldier stationed there referred to it as the most thoroughly godforsaken post in the West. Few, if any, traces of the camp remain today, save for a small historical marker that acknowledges the site. In the years after the Civil War, however, Camp Grant was home to soldiers whose charge it was to protect travel routes and defend against raiding conducted by Athapascan-speaking peoples in the area. The Athapascan speakers, referred to by those outside their groups as Apache, were the traditional enemies of Arizona's Otham people. They had for years been notorious for stealing Otham, Mexican, and American cattle, and sometimes killing their owners. American soldiers stationed at Camp Grant had spent much of the Civil War period in a prolonged fight against Arizona's Chiricahua Apache peoples, and they spent much of the time after the war pursuing various Western Apache groups through the Arizona wilderness. Many of the Arizona Territory's residents approved of and celebrated these campaigns, as they believed the territory would be a much safer place to live if the Apache were exterminated. By the late 1860s, however, the situation in Arizona was already beginning to change. The election of Civil War military hero Ulysses S. Grant to the U.S. presidency in 1868 brought with it a shift in national policy toward Indians. Initially, Grant's status as a military man had made many Westerners optimistic that the new commander-in-chief would use the military to strike out against and eradicate the Western Indian groups. Much to their surprise and disappointment, however, Grant announced his intention to take a different tack. When he was inaugurated in 1869, Grant declared that he would pursue a peace policy toward Native Americans. So long as Indians were willing to agree to peace with the government and settlers, settle on reservations, and Christianize, the U.S. would extend them aid and eventually the rights of citizenship. Grant's was an assimilationist policy, and one that limited some of the military's control over Indian affairs. While the army could still pursue so-called hostile Indians, it could not interfere with the affairs on established reservations. 
The job of distributing supplies and managing the day-to-day -day happenings on those reservations would fall to religious missionaries who were under the supervision of the newly created Board of Indian Affairs. The Board of Indian Affairs itself was placed under the control of its first ever indigenous commissioner. That commissioner was Eli Parker, a Seneca man who had served alongside Grant in the Civil War. Acting under Grant's new directives, Colonel George Stoneman, the head of the Army's Department of Arizona, began efforts to appeal to local indigenous groups for peace. Stoneman ordered his men to distribute rations to Indians who came to army posts and agreed to cease their attacks on the army or territorial residents. He also made efforts to scale back the army's presence in Arizona, proposing that five military posts in the territory be closed. Stoneman's decisions, as well as his choice to move his headquarters to California to avoid what he saw as the miserable climate of Arizona, made him unpopular with many Anglos in the territory. Colonel Stoneman was not around to weigh in in February of 1871, when one of his first lieutenants made a fateful decision. That first lieutenant, 37-year-old Royal Emerson Whitman, was in command of Camp Grant when five elderly Apache women approached him. The women had come to the camp apparently in search of a boy who had been taken prisoner by the army. In reality, the women had another motive as well. They sought to negotiate a peace. In many indigenous groups, negotiating for peace was a task reserved for women, and these particular women were eager to see how the U.S. Army might receive them. When they approached Lieutenant Whitman, he responded kindly and provided them with rations and blankets. The women reported this to the leaders of their band of Pinal and Aravaipa Apaches, Heshkabanzan, whose name is sometimes recorded as Eskiminzen or Eskimizen, and Captain Tukito. Eager to break free of a cycle of flight and fighting that had left their people without resources, Hashkabanzen and Captain Chiquito themselves came to Camp Grant to talk peace with Whitman and with the U.S. Army. They told Whitman that their people only wished to farm, and they asked him to provide rations to feed them until they could plant crops. Whitman, who had no formal authority to establish a reservation, nevertheless agreed to receive the Aravaipa into his custody. He set up employment for some of the Apache at local ranches, and gave others ration tickets in return for supplying hay to the camp's horses. Soon, nearly 500 Apache were settled in the area around Camp Grant and receiving rations from the army. Although these Apache were literally classified as prisoners of war under the custody of the army, they had freedom of movement. Indeed, by spring, the Apache at Camp Grant had asked permission to move their settlement about five miles east of the camp in order to farm in the more fertile area near Aravaipa Canyon. Notably, Lieutenant Whitman was hesitant to agree to this arrangement, in part because he had not yet received permission from Colonel Stoneman to establish a reservation. A letter he had written to Stoneman on the subject had been returned unopened because Whitman had forgotten to follow protocol by not attaching a summary of its contents to the outside of the envelope. Perhaps aware that his decision to shelter the Aravaipa Apache might be controversial, Whitman urged Escobanzan to move his people to the more established Apache reservation in the White Mountains. Escobanzan declined, explaining that the White Mountain Apache were not his people, and that the diet of mezcal, or roasted agave, to which his people had become accustomed over centuries, was not available there. Whitman accepted his request to move east into Aravaipa Canyon. On the night of April 29, 1871, the Aravaipa Apache held a dance to celebrate their peace agreement with the army. However, unbeknownst to them as they drifted to sleep with men and women in separate camps, plans were already in motion to disrupt that peace. A day earlier, a large group of men had quietly and gradually departed the city of Tucson so as not to attract attention to their absence. For weeks, these men had been holding meetings as the self-appointed Committee of Public Safety to discuss how residents of the territory might combat Apache raiding and attacks. Some of those meetings took place at the very courthouse where the men would later be tried for murder. 
After much talking, the men hatched a plan to act. On the night of April 28th, they gathered outside the city, near the Riedo, and met up with residents of San Javier. Together, their group of approximately 140 men traveled by moonlight to the San Pedro River. After camping until the mid-afternoon of April 29th, the men proceeded to the area around Camp Grant, taking less traveled paths and traveling in the moonlight to conceal their presence. In the pre-dawn hours of April 30th, they surrounded the camp where the Aravaipa Apache slumbered. Then, as the first light broke, they began their assault. Members of the Thano Otham Nation descended on the Apache with clubs, bludgeoning many of them to death as they slept. Americans and Mexicans fired their guns into the camp. As the sounds of the assault woke the sleeping Apache, some began to flee in terror. Those who tried to cross the creek or scale the canyon were largely picked off by armed men stationed on the ridge above. The whole assault on the camp lasted only thirty minutes to an hour. When it concluded, dozens of Apache lay dead. No one, as it turns out, could agree on the exact number. Some said as few as thirty or forty, while others estimated closer to a hundred and forty. The one thing accounts agreed on is that almost all of the dead were women and children. Perhaps as many as 30 additional Apache children and infants were taken by the raiding party, with many of them marched away to be given to local families or sold into Mexico as servants. The men who attacked the camp, realizing that they had suffered not a single loss in the assault, congratulated themselves for a job well done. Gradually they made their way back toward Tucson. Because the attackers had taken care to conceal their movements in advance of the assault, the soldiers at Camp Grant initially had no idea that anything had gone wrong. When Lieutenant Whitman finally made his way to the Apache encampment in the mid-morning, he found himself met with a gruesome sight. He quickly reported the assault to his superiors and ordered his men to bury the bodies. When word of what had happened at Camp Grant reached the press and government officials in the eastern U.S., the reaction was one of horror. President Grant decried the attack on the Apache as purely murder and insisted that the attackers would face justice. The press in the eastern states expressed disgust at what they saw as a blatant act of brutality. One New York paper, critical of the Arizonans, wrote, government to take immediate steps to ascertain, in the first place, how it happened that an armed body of citizens with Indian allies was allowed to be organized at a military post to the United States for the purpose of massacring Indian women and children. The Indians were peaceable and had claimed that they were living under the protection of the government. The Philadelphia Inquirer, meanwhile, pronounced the killing of the Apache at Camp Grant a horrible massacre perpetuated by cowardly butchers. Of the whole number killed, 125, only eight were men, and the rest were women and children. The paper called for immediate government action. If we have a government that was able to put down the slaveholders' rebellion, we have one strong enough to bring to justice the murderers of those poor Indians. It is their most urgent duty to investigate the whole affair to discover its authors and actors, and to show them, by the infliction of the extremist penalty of the law, that the heart of the whole country is moved to redress a wrong against humanity so terrible as the tragedy of Camp Grant. In Arizona, however, reactions to the killings at Camp Grant could not have been more different. Instead of decrying the violence, many Arizona newspapers celebrated it and praised the men involved. So reluctant were Arizonans to condemn what had happened at Camp Grant that it took a threat from President Grant, the camp's namesake, to spur local courts into action. Grant informed Arizona Governor A.P. Safford that if no steps were taken to prosecute the Camp Grant attackers for murder, he would place the territory under martial law and see to it that they were tried in a military tribunal. Reluctantly, Arizona's U.S. District Attorney charged the hundred local men who would eventually gather outside of the Tucson courthouse with a number of counts related to an estimated a hundred deaths. 
Because the Apache were technically prisoners of war under the charge of the U.S. military, the murder charges were federal. The men's trial lasted for five days, during which most of the accused made no effort to deny their participation in the killings. On the fifth day, a jury composed of local men, many of whom knew the defendants personally, received their instructions from Judge John Titus. A mere 19 minutes after being sent off to deliberate, the men delivered their verdicts. The Camp Grant attackers were not guilty on all counts. Why did so many residents of Arizona, including the judge and jury in this case and members of the press, think and talk about these killings so differently than federal officials or the press in the eastern states? How should we understand the events at Camp Grant in relation to federal Indian policy and to broader patterns of violence in the West? What can we learn about Arizona's history, not just from these killings, but from the ways that different groups of Arizona residents talked and thought about them, remembered and forgot them years later.